Hello, BookTube. Recently, Grammaticus Books, wonderful channel, heck of a guy, came to visit me here in Boston. I'll leave a link to his video down below. He did a video about his top five science fiction movies adapted from novels. Always a promising bro tube subject, and so here I am. <laughs> I saw, I watched his video, I thought we'd go over his picks, and then I would give you the real picks. <laughs> in other words, mine. Although, some of his picks are quite good. They would definitely be on a top 10 list of mine. His list overall uh, indicates a few things. Uh, such lists will always indicate a few things about what kind of a movie watcher you are. In his case, uh, <laughs> it, it underscores the fact that he's wicked old. <laughs> And also, I would guess that he hasn't crossed the door of a movie theater in 30 years. <laughs> but but uh, his list is still fascinating, and I wonder what you'll make of it. Those of you who are science fiction fans will certainly have lists of your own that you will now obligately have to change once you learn what my list is. <laughs> but his first pick, his number five, is David Lynch's Doom, uh, which is... A car crash. It is, it is a slippery, slick, chaotic, drunken car crash. In his defense of it, the limited defense that he mounts of it, he mentions that there are great actors in it. But they, it's true, but they don't do any good acting. He mentions that the, the thing is full of bad acting. That's absolutely true. It's also full of bad directing, as only David Lynch can do. And his foremost defense of this movie is that it's got good costumes, good settings. That's That's... Not enough <laughs> to make a good movie. The, the David Lynch Dune movie is not only not in the top five, it's probably in the bottom five. It's one of the worst movies ever made. So, so that was one of that was he was his list was off to a rocky start. But he recovers things right away with the John Carpenter adaptation of John Campbell's story. Who goes there? Called The Thing, uh, starring Kurt Russell. Some of you will know this movie. Uh, it's memorable <laughs> it's extremely memorable uh and it is wonderful absolutely wonderful i think probably one of the high marks for science fiction horror it and alien that exists still uh it, really really worthwhile probably wouldn't be on my top 10 list but it would be on there then for for grammaticus's third choice he leaves the sheltered 80s of his childhood and goes to uh Straight to Dude Bro Land with The Martian, Ridley Scott's adaptation of Andy Weir's novel starring Matt Damon. I know that The Martian, both the book and the movie, are fan, have uh, favorites of a lot of people. Probably a lot of you are fans of it. I, The first word that comes to my mind when I think of it is the same word that accurately describes Mars, which is lifeless. <laughs> it's absolutely lifeless. The potatoes in the movie have more on-screen charisma than Matt Damon. He is a dead-eyed plank of wood in everything that he does. I had to suffer through him in Oppenheimer. I, I just, he's going to have a career in Hollywood. He has name recognition. But as a star carrying a movie, The Martian is what you get if you do that. I just... Uh, I, uh, he wasn't at all in any way believable or likable. And I, Hollywood, had, there are a number of actors who could have done that role and made the movie great even despite... In his video, Grammaticus mentions that you sort of have to look askance at a couple of recent movies from Ridley Scott. I would argue that that is absolutely true, first of all, and that that goes all the way back. You'll either get, uh, there's even been gossip on movie sets, you'll either get the right Ridley Scott or you'll get the wrong Ridley Scott. And the wrong one, mm, he's showing up, he's punching boxes, but there isn't much there. There isn't much there that isn't being provided by his director of photography. Uh, I know directors don't matter, but ordinarily you have a signature. And Ridley Scott can usually be lied upon to do that. I don't think a Martian has his signature at all. Uh, but for his second pick, uh, Grammaticus picks... Uh, a Ridley Scott movie that obviously, absolutely does have his signature. In fact, it's all signature. And that is Blade Runner, uh, which is adapted from a rotten novel by Philip K. Dick. And the only way Ridley Scott saw this as a, as a younger, much younger director than in The Martian, he saw that the only way you could adapt Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Philip K. Dick's novel, would be to gut it. <laughs> Just throw out 95% of it. And so he does. 
uh, and reworks the whole thing into a world of his own. Blade Runner is a masterpiece. Absolutely a masterpiece. It is, it is not going to be in my top five, but it would certainly be in my top ten. I think it, that it, it's a masterpiece, but I think it's a little bit in love with its own moodiness and can be a little bit clunky, <laughs> just, a, just a little bit telegrammatic. Uh, and then there's Grammaticus's number one, <laughs> his pick for the best science fiction movie adaptation of them all. <laughs> and it's, it's Paul Voorhees' Starship Troopers. Now... This is tough. <laughs> this is tough for me because, like any other person, a right, same thinking person in the world, I love Starship Troopers. Absolutely love it. What a movie. What an absolute gem of a movie. But in his video, Grammatica says, he mentions that, that the movie was lambasted by critics when it first came out as being fascist apologia, as being fascist propaganda. And that he mentions parenthetically that a lot of those critics have since recanted the only reason they've recanted is because film critics are even more cowardly than book critics and when they realize that the movie was a hit a long-term hit not even a cult favorite that it was now regularly esteemed they didn't want to be on the wrong side of that so they all so they all recanted but nevertheless uh grammatica says that uh their their original opinions that this is fascist propaganda don't make any sense because the movie is beating you over the head with its satire of fascist propaganda and that how could you possibly miss that and i agree that of course for even is putting in that sat that satire is all throughout the movie that is absolutely there but uh your average moviegoer and even your average moviegoing critic is not a, a due paying Skinner box sociology experiment with diodes looked up to their heads. They're watching what they're watching. They're absorbing what the director is intentionally putting out there. And in Starship Troopers, not only is Cap Van Dien the hero, uh, uh, an enthusiastic proponent of the fascist ideology of the movie, but also the guy you're supposed to root for the most. Michael Ironsides, the, the, the gruff amputee classroom teacher who then becomes a gruff amputee troop leader and dies heroically those things aren't satire those elements aren't satire you the the central cast of this movie is intensely humanized for the reader so if this is Voorhees satirizing fascist propaganda i would argue that he's that he's straying well into fascist propaganda territory in order to do it <laughs> i mean what difference where is the thin dividing line between all the efforts that he makes, which are entirely successful, to charismatically humanize the fascists in his movie and Triumph of the Will. Where, where is the difference between... Where's the, where's the dividing line there? You're still coming out of the movie hoping that Cap Van Dien's character is okay. <laughs> You're still coming out of the movie rooting for him. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is, that is I would argue, a large part of what the movie wants you to do, regardless of where the satire is. Nevertheless, I agree that it is a terrific movie. It's a great it's a great thing to think about in terms of what the director is trying to do, which is not something I usually like to think about when I'm, when I'm thinking about movies because directors don't matter and they're all they're also rather dumb. Most of them are rather dumb. Vor even's not as dumb as for instance Ridley Scott just as a person in conversation, but oh my, what a discussion that would be between Grammaticus books and myself. Oh my. But those are his top five movies. Bring back the 80s. <laughs> uh, and then I want to give you my top five. Some of his are very good. I made a point when I made my top five of not duplicating any of his, not only because that wouldn't give you your bang for your buck, but also because I think my five are better than his five. Uh, although he's going to howl about that and the movie purists are certainly going to, oh my God, my number one is going to make every movie purist in the world howl. But we'll start with number five. If he can go back to his youth, I can go back to mine. And so I want, I want to mention Stanley Kramer's direct, uh, Stanley, Stanley, Stanley Kramer's movie of Neville Shute's novel On the Beach. This is from 1959. Uh, and it's the story of, uh, it's a post-apocalyptic novel. The, the nuclear apocalypse has already happened. And as would happen, that doesn't just wink out life all over the planet simultaneously. The gigantic swaths of lethal radioactivity are making their way around the planet, being pulled and pushed 
by the planet's normal atmospheric systems. And what we can only assume is the last remnant of humanity is cloistered together in one small tip of Australia waiting for the end. There's nothing they can do about it. There's nowhere they can go. Uh, and it's, it's, it stars Gregory Peck and Fred Astaire in, a, in an acting turn. And it's really, really good. Oh, my. It's really, really good. Uh, so that's going to be my number five. Then my number four, well, <laughs> my number four is The Watchmen by Zack Snyder, adapted from the graphic novel by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. The story of what the world would really be like if there really were mass vigilantes or even superheroes, supernatural, super, super powered beings. What would the world really be like? Uh, Alan Moore's graphic novel was, it was 12 issue series of comic books and it was brought into, it was collected into a volume. I've talked about it many times on this channel. And it is very effective, but it has huge flaws. The Watchmen, the graphic novel, has huge flaws. You can see it in the background of Grammaticus' video, I believe. It has huge flaws. It has gigantic stretches where Alan Moore simply bloviates. It has gigantic digressions that, that have the dude bros sitting up and clapping like seals at SeaWorld, but that are terrible and ought to have been cut. If Alan Moore hadn't been already a psychopathic, you know, Swamp Thing monster at the time when he did this thing, his editor would have cut them. Any editor should have. And the glory of Zack Snyder's Watchmen movie is that he does cut all that crap. He cuts all the Alan Moore stuff out, except for the brilliant storytelling, which Alan Moore is, of course, he is a brilliant storyteller. It's just... He needs a bridle. Every once in a while, he needs a bridle on him. And he doesn't have it in the Watchmen comic book. But Zack Snyder takes out the Black Frigate. He takes out the ridiculous complications at the end of the story. I won't give anything away, but the ending of the story, the big shebang at the end of the story, is obvious from the second chapter of Watchmen. And that is what Zack Snyder gives you. <laughs> whereas, whereas Alan Moore just keeps complicating it and complicating it. There are some images, there are some lines that he wanted to have. He just distorts the story in order to give you those things, in order to put those things in there. Zack Snyder takes them out. And he also makes it breakneck watching. And beautiful. It's it's beautifully done. So, so that's going to be my number four. A bit of a controversy. Of, uh, Number three is also a bit of a controversy. This is Gavin Hood's 2013 adaptation of Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game. A movie that didn't get a whole lot of views when it came out and had the critics largely split. Uh, the, the split took the nature, as far as I could see, that the critics who were familiar with the book didn't like the movie. And the ones who weren't familiar with the book did like the movie. And in this case, that, that just shows you... Uh, the problem with adapting literary works. I am, to put it mildly, very familiar with the book. And I thought the movie was wonderful. Just, just wonderful. Really first-rate thing. Uh, a little bit on the leaden side, but I don't think Grammaticus Books, of all people, is going to, is going to criticize me for picking a, a movie that's a bit on the leaden side when he, when he picked Blade Runner. <laughs> so I, I think we're gonna, we have to let that go by the wayside. And even the leaden parts, not really crystal sharp acting all around uh, and some of the scenes especially at the climax of Ender's Game are very melodramatic if you didn't play them that way you'd be disserving them uh, so I'm going to include Gavin Hood's Ender's Game even though it came and went in part of the special effects extravaganza don't think a lot of people paid attention to it and then my next one is from 1980 I've mentioned this before on this channel I cannot praise it highly enough and it shows what you can do with intelligent directing, intelligent writing, really good acting, and zero special effects. I could pay for the special effects on this thing. It was done by the PBS. And it's their adaptation of Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Lathe of Heaven, starring a very, very young Bruce Dern in the story of a man whose dreams change reality. And it is wonderful. There was a movie, I think, 20 years later, that, that had a movie budget and movie cast and whatnot. It was nothing like as good as the 1980 version. So I want to include that one, definitely. I, I know it's not as, as well-known. I don't know that there's a DVD of it, but uh, if it's not well-known, <laughs> if it's not well-known, uh, the well-known factor will be made up by my choice for number one. Now, keep in mind, we are talking here about science fiction movies that were adapted from novels. 
that's why I'm picking the ones I'm picking. I'm not saying science fiction novels just in general, oh, science fiction movies just in general. Most science fiction movies, at least for most of the time that science fiction movies are being made, great, many of them were not adapted from any literary source at all, a graphic novel, short story, a novel at all. They were, they were, uh, they sprung out of the minds of their creators. And that is definitely true for the best science fiction movie, which also just coincidentally happens to be the best movie ever made, and that of course is Lilo and Stitch. That is science fiction to its core, but it's not adapted from anything, so it doesn't count. Instead, for my number one, I'm going to go with a little-known art house movie named Jurassic Park, <laughs> directed by Steven Spielberg just a couple of years after Michael Crichton's novel came out. The story of attempts to clone dinosaurs and bring them into the modern world. Try to forget all the nonsense that comes later. All the movies that come later, try to forget all the Chris Pratt stuff and everything else, and just concentrate on the story, which, I might add, in Michael Crichton's original novel, is largely botched. It is, it, it's disproportionate, it's extremely overwordy, and it misses, in, 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 two scenes leading up to the climax, and then in the climax itself, in the novel, the novel misses its own point, which you'd think would be hard to do, but if anybody's going to be able to do it, it's going to be Michael Crichton. Whereas Spielberg, he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what points he wants to make. And he leaves you to see a lot of them. He is a very sticky director, very much so. He's a very gimmicky director. I used to bother me, Matt. Now I find it endearing. Uh, Certainly, it comes from heart. At least you can say that. At least it's not Hollywood cookie cutter. That Hollywood cookie cutter gimmicks defines the later Jurassic World franchise. But Spielberg, I think, means it. I might be wrong about that. I've never met the man. But I think he means it. And Jurassic Park, the movie from 1993, is brilliant. <laughs> it is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure that, that some of its most effective sequences are more effective than the effective sequences in Independence Day. But Independence Day is not adapted from anything. So I can't I can't include Independence Day. I can't technically include Predator 2. I kinda want to, either Predator or Predator 2. I can't technically include it even though uh David Drake wrote Predator and he was just ripped off. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, it wasn't explicitly adapted from anything. So I can't include those. But Jurassic Park, I can sure as heck include, because it's adapted from a wordy and, and kind of dumb novel and made into a brilliant, brilliant movie. And there's also a bit of symmetry. In one particular scene, there's a bit of symmetry between it and On the Beach. The kind of little callbacks and visual echoes that always remind you that Spielberg, unlike a lot of modern directors, is a film junkie. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> you now have my top five the top five. Grammaticus's top five, some of them, three of them, might make a top ten or a top fifteen. The David Lynch doom. I ask you. <laughs> but, but, now I want to know what you think, especially if you're a dude who has a booktube channel, because this is as dude bro -like subject as you could possibly get, unless we're going to, to tier rank the Cosmere novels or something like that might be more dude bro but other than that no <laughs> they've got any more dude bro than this give me five drop and give me five what are your top five science fiction movies adapted from novels now keep in mind when you've got you've got Grammaticus's list he has Blade Runner he has Starship Troopers he has The Thing uh you've got my my list which has is all winners <laughs> Your list might have some of those. That's perfectly okay. What I want from your list is not so much the list as your thoughts. Tell me what you like and don't like. Oh my god, I could go on about all ten of these movies forever and ever. Unfortunately, if I went on forever and ever about David Lynch's Dune, most of it would be uh, profanities. <laughs> so, so uh, the, but, but my movies? Oh my. <laughs> oh my. And, just as a parting parenthetical, uh, First of all, you Lars von Trier fans, you you uh, black and white fans, I don't want to hear any guff about my my obvious contention that Lilo and Stitch is the greatest movie ever made. But in addition to that, 
if there's anyone listening to me who hasn't watched Lilo and Stitch, let's correct that before you watch any of the movies on either Grammaticus's list or mine. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, I'll wrap this up for now, a little film contention for your day, <laughs> but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.